Many people find themselves in seasons of life when they feel forsaken by God. I wonder how many of us have ever been one of those people. A lot of times it happens in a crisis. Maybe a loved one has died. Maybe a marriage is broken beyond repair. Maybe you've just received a diagnosis. And you haven't stopped praying, and you haven't stopped reading your Bible, but you just don't feel God's nearness. You just don't feel His presence like you did before. And maybe you remember what it used to be like. When you feel, just felt this, this richness and, and you, you, you could read the Scriptures and you felt that the Spirit of God was near and you felt that He heard your prayers, but now it just feels like you pray and they fall on deaf ears and, and these, these feelings become almost un, unavoidable. No matter how hard you try, you can't seem to overcome it. It's interesting to remember that we're not the first ones to ever feel like God had forsaken us. I can't help but think of the Hebrew people in Egypt under the cruel taskmasters crying out to God, you promised Abraham you would be our God. Where are you? I can't help but think of the Hebrew people in exile, in Babylon. Millennia later, when God had been there in the land, His presence in the temple, and nevertheless He allowed their enemies to overtake them and withdrew His presence. And they cried out from exile, how long? Will you remain distant? Even when they came back into the land, the manifest presence of the glory of God never returned to the temple in Jerusalem. And they still cried out, Where are you, God? Mark presents Jesus asking the same question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we attach a lot of theological interpretations to that. We'll get to those in just a minute. For now, what I want you to see is how Mark puts Jesus specifically into the place where the people of God have, have shared this experience of feeling forsaken, of having our experience of this, 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 my prayers are falling on deaf ears, and I just, where are you, God? I'm in my moment of need, and where are you? Mark wants us to see that God Himself in the person of Christ is no stranger to that experience that is common to so many century after century and millennia after millennia. And Mark presents Jesus to us in this way, in His death and in His resurrection, together. Because he wants us to see that God is indeed faithful, despite the fact that we feel forsaken. You hear that? Mark wants us to see that at this moment, this moment of greatest sorrow, God is most faithful. Mark wants us to see that God stays faithful even when we feel forsaken. We'll let that be the bottom line today. God stays faithful even when we feel forsaken. Jesus' family 
and his followers must have certainly felt forsaken. We are told that they are there a bit of a distance. The whole land has become dark. Mark wants the tone of this to be heavy, and he amplifies this, this, this darkness and this sadness, and Jesus with this cry, My God, why have you forsaken me? He tells us about the women who were there looking on from a distance. They didn't get too close, but they hadn't yet departed. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, they're women who were a part of Jesus' entourage, his group, his followers. Notice we don't hear anything about Peter in this moment. The women are there, they're faithful, they're present. The men are nowhere to be found. We do hear about Joseph of Arimathea, who was waiting expectantly for the kingdom. And again, we are reminded that the whole Gospel of Mark, from beginning to end, chapter 1, Jesus comes proclaiming, the kingdom of God has come. And now in chapter 15, we are reminded that this is about waiting for the kingdom. Joseph was, he was one of the respected members of the council, but he was waiting for the kingdom. But this ending was totally unexpected. Nobody expected Jesus' kingdom ministry to come to this conclusion. And they all felt forsaken. They all felt abandoned by God. And that feeling, that where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me, God? That, that, that common shared experience that all of them have, that the people of God throughout history from time to time have had, that many of us have likely had, in moments of great dark, that dark night of the soul, that sorrow, we find Jesus experiencing those same emotions, that same psychology, that same sorrow, that same grief. When he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you know your Bible, you know Jesus is actually quoting his Bible in this passage. This is a quote from Mark or from the Psalms, Psalm 22, verse 1. And we typically read it in a certain way. And we have songs about this, this passage. It's so it's massively important to so many of us. But we often read this as sort of somehow in this moment, because Jesus is got the weight of the world's sin on him, and, and, and there's this, this interpretation that says, well, God can't look at that, and his eyes can't look on sin, and so somehow the Father literally turns his face away from Jesus, turns his back to Jesus, so that Jesus cries out because he feels this distanced relationship between him and his Father. Pretty common interpretation. I imagine a few of us have heard that one before. Anybody? Nobody's raising their hand. Have you ever, like, we know that one, don't we? Ty is both thanks to know. I got it, all right. Because if that, if we haven't heard that, the entire sermon won't work. <laughs> Here's the thing. And, and I've heard, friends, I've heard credentialed theologians stand before crowds of people and say, at this moment, the Trinity came apart. And I have no idea how to even begin thinking about that. And if that's right, then what does it mean for God? I mean, isn't Jesus being faithful here? Isn't He doing exactly what His Father has asked Him to do? Isn't He doing the thing for which the Father says, Beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. He's bringing the kingdom. He's reconciling God's children to God. He's doing exactly what He's supposed to do. And are we to think that when we actually do what we're supposed to do, that's when God abandons us? That's not very helpful or comforting in moments like this. I mean, are we really supposed to think that in this moment of Jesus' greatest faithfulness and His greatest agony, that God does an about-face. Is that what a loving father does when his children are in pain? Should we think that we're more loving than God? 
Because when one of my kids falls off their bike and scrapes their knee, I get there as fast as I can. So what's going on here? A little principle for interpreting the Bible. When the Bible quotes the Bible, go read the quote and find out what ha- what's going on. So if you want to flip over to Psalm 22, we're going to dwell there for a moment. I figure if this passage was important enough for Jesus to quote at his moment of death, it's probably important enough for us to read. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. It seems to get worse, doesn't it? When we actually read the psalm. This ex- and the psalmist is our... T- I mean, this is thousand years before Jesus, but the psalmist is expressing this thing that so many of us have felt. So many of us, in the, before the psalmist and after the psalmist, is expressing this, this thing where we, we find ourselves in our room and we're, we're filled with sorrow and we're praying... Where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? He's, he's, I'm, I'm crying out to you. I'm praying to you, but you don't answer. I feel like I'm praying, but they don't get past the ceiling. And I just, what's going on? And yet, immediately in verse 3, the psalmist reminds himself that God is always faithful. This is what Jesus has, is meditating on as he is hanging on the cross. Verse 3, Yet you are holy. Even though I feel abandoned, I remember that you are holy. You are enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. Now does that begin to reframe the crucifixion for you any? Jesus isn't just going, I'm all alone here. He is meditating in His greatest hour of need on a psalm that rehearses the faithfulness of God from Abraham all the way up to the present day. I feel abandoned, but I know better. Because you're holy. Because you keep your promises. Because you are faithful to your people. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried and they were saved. That doesn't negate the present circumstances. Verse 6. I'm a worm and not a human scorned by others, despised by the people. And you just, the church has long seen Psalm 22 as this anticipation, this prophecy of the crucifixion. All who see me mock at me, verse 7. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let Him deliver because nobody else is going to. Let Him rescue the one in whom He has delighted. And then it goes back to this You know me, God. I trust you with verse 9. Notice how it just kind of goes back and forth and you can feel this kind of internal angst. I feel abandoned, but I know better. I feel abandoned, but I know better. I feel abandoned, but God is faithful. Verse 9, yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. You feel the tone back and forth. It's agony, but I trust you. I'm in agony, but I trust you. They mock me, but you are faithful. They, they, they curse me, but you have held me in your hand since my birth. You see how the psalm works? Verse 11, don't be far from me. Because trouble is near and there's no one else to help. This is the psalm that Jesus is meditating on in his final moments before his death. Do not be far from me. There is no one else to help. And again, the psalmist amplifies for us 
speaking through the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit, the gruesomeness of the crucifixion. Bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouth like a ravening and roaring lion. The psalmist is not going to let us forget how bad this is. He is not one to sugarcoat difficult things. This isn't, you know, hey, I'm not feeling too good, so let's find some therapy and try to, you know, accentuate the positive or something. Like, he's not accentuating the positive. He's, de- he's taking full on the reality, and he laments. I think sometimes the people of God have forgotten how to lament. Like the Bible is full. There's a whole book, Lamentations. Do we know what that even means? Like this mo- and, and a lament is this moment where our hearts feel broken and we cry out to God and we say, you know, this is horrifying. It's been a terrible year and people are suffering and the world is in pain and, there, and, it's, and it's multifaceted. It's health, it's economic, it's, it's, there's divisiveness and we, we are here and we're in the middle of it and it's, it's agonizing and it's frustrating and, 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 and we need to name that to God, don't we? And the psalmist teaches us we need to name our agony before God. We don't need to pretend, hey, it's okay, you know, God. Yeah, I'm hurting, but everything's good. Just great, you know. Just just put on, like, and and church trains us to put on that face, doesn't it? Sunday morning, come on in. Your life may be, like, crumbling in your hands, but put on a smile, right? Right? We need, to, like, we need to let Jesus teach us and we need to let the psalmist teach us that there are appropriate times where the people of God gather and the songs are sad. I'm poured out like water, verse 14. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. And again, we're reminded this is about the crucifixion when he says, you lay me in the dust of death. Death does not mean God is not faithful. Dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing they cast lots. No wonder Jesus was thinking about this psalm. As the soldiers ripped his clothes and dressed him in mocking purple garments and cast lots for his garments. We're still in that back and forth. Here's my experience. Here's reality. I feel abandoned, but God is faithful. Verse 19, but you, O Lord, don't be far away. My help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have rescued me. Notice how the tense changes there. The faithfulness of God becomes an existing reality for the, the psalmist who's praying. It was, where are you? Now it's, you've rescued my ancestors and you have rescued me. From the horns of wild oxen you've rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. I want you to imagine Jesus hanging on the cross, meditating on this psalm, uttering those words under His breath as He dies for us. Praying out to God, Why have you forsaken me? But I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. Stand in awe of Him. You offspring of Israel. For He did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. When Jesus was on the cross, 
afflicted for our sake. He is meditating on a psalm that says, God does not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. And now listen to this. If you have any question, verse 24, he did not hide his face from me. Did you catch that? One of the most common interpretations of the my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that God actually turned his face from Jesus. The ironic thing is that Jesus is meditating on a psalm that says, you don't hide your face from the afflicted. Like if the traditional conventional interpretation is right, then Jesus is praying the psalm in a way that contradicts what it actually says. Which means he probably isn't praying it that way. Here's the point. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't mean that God actually turned his back on Jesus. It means that Jesus knows what it feels like to be alone, to be pressed down, to be crushed, to be afflicted, to be abhorred. But he knows that in that moment, the God who made heaven and earth, the God who eternally begets him, the God with whom, the God who he pleases, the God to whom he has been faithful, did not hide his face. I remember the first time I really actually read this psalm in the context of the quote. Because I kind of took the conventional interpretation for a long time. Yeah, God can't look on sin, so he turns his face. And then I really, like, you know, learned the principle when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, go read what it says. And not just the first verse, but the whole thing. And you discover as you read it that it is one of the most beautiful, faithful, glorious, like I want, I love this God. Who says, when you feel like your world is in pieces, I will not turn my face from you. Never. No matter what it feels like, no matter how bad it hurts, no matter how distant it feels, you cannot trust your emotions on that. You cannot trust your experience on that. Your heart will mislead you. God is faithful. He doesn't turn away. He doesn't go... When his children stumble, when his children hurt, when his children are bleeding, he races to them. Just like any loving father. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And Jesus meditates in his moment of agony when he offers himself for us, for our transgressions, for our sin. When he brings in the kingdom, like remember what's written above his head. In this moment, as he cries out, he is inaugurating the kingdom of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And the Bible says, God did not hide his face. God stays faithful even when we feel forsaken. I think about times in my own life when it felt like things had just crumbled. I think about when I was 10 years old and lost my dad. World shattering. He was 35. But I can testify God stays faithful. Even when it feels like the world has completely shattered, God is faithful. He doesn't abandon His people. He doesn't turn His back. He stays faithful even when we feel forsaken. You undoubtedly can think of moments in your life where that distance was there. And if you haven't got that yet, just give it time. In those moments, remember, God stays faithful. It
it is an important reminder that we cannot necessarily trust the way we feel. It's an important time to remember that our hearts will indeed mislead us. That's important because so much of pop culture says what? Follow your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitful. (laughs) So if you want to follow it, by all means, but chances are it will wind up bad for you. What you need is the Son of God crucified and risen to come and take your heart and make it whole. Follow Him. I want to read the rest of the psalm. He did not hide His face from me, but but heard. He heard me when I cried to Him. Verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Remember that kingdom thing we were talking about? There it is again. Mark's not the only one who takes the kingdom and the cross and wraps them together. Psalm 22 does as well. That in the midst of this great agony, when it looks like the powers of darkness had won, when it looked like Caesar and the Roman Empire and Pilate, his representative, when it looks like they had won, in reality, the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship Him, for dominion belongs to the Lord and He rules over all nations. In that moment, Jesus is coming into his kingdom. It doesn't look like what anyone expected, but it is the ultimate expression of the faithfulness of God. It is the perfect expression of the faithfulness of God. Verse 29, To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Now, in the ancient Near East, sleep in the earth was a metaphor. You might want to take a guess what it's a metaphor of. Death. That's right. But death in this psalm is not the end of the story. All who sleep in the earth bow down to him. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Another metaphor for death. And then you get at the end of verse 29 the crucial verse, I shall live for him. Notice the psalm is structured by this movement from death to life. Sleeping in the dust is not the end. All who sleep in the dust will worship Him. Like Dying doesn't mean you don't have to deal with God. <laughs> and He's the God of life. And Jesus, as He is hanging on the cross, declares the faithfulness of God and meditates on a psalm that concludes near its end, I will live for Him. Jesus on the cross in His agony as the blood flow and as His body was traumatized and as His skin hung from His bones meditated on a psalm that climaxes in hope for resurrection. I shall, future tense, live for Him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. That's our part of the story. We are the posterity. We are the future generations. We have been told about the Lord, and we are called to proclaim his faithfulness even when we feel forsaken. Proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. The bottom line for that psalm, the bottom line for Mark 15 and 16, no matter how it feels, no matter what the world says, no matter what circumstances suggest, God stays faithful even when we feel forsaken. Feelings don't trump the truth of God's faithfulness. You might need to hear that. The way I feel, it feels real, doesn't it? But there is a deeper reality. There is a greater reality. There is a truer truth. And it is the truth 
that God is faithful even when we feel forsaken. That's why, even though we don't have the tail end of Mark's gospel, we know how the story ends. Even if the ending was unexpected. Nobody expected the kingdom to come through a cross. Nobody expected a Messiah who would die and then be raised. But God demonstrates his faithfulness when everyone feels like he's abandoned them, whether it's the women by the cross, whether it's Joseph, whether it's when the women are going to the tomb the next day. Notice how they have a need. Who will roll the stone away? And when they get there, they found their need is met. It's already been rolled away. And not only has their need been met, a need they didn't even know they had has been met. Their grief is being comforted. Their broken hearts are being knit back together because Jesus, though he was dead, has been raised. I bet Peter felt forsaken. Notice, like Peter doesn't, he's not in the story. He's not at the foot of the cross, and we don't get to hear about him coming to the tomb in Mark's gospel. Maybe that was in the part that got crumbled up on the end of the scroll. I don't know. Never will, I guess. Maybe somebody will find that missing manuscript one day. (laughs) The angel says specifically, go tell the disciples and Peter, because obviously they felt forsaken, didn't they? I bet Peter, (laughs) I mean, I'll die with you, Jesus. And then when the moment comes, when the swords are drawn, when Jesus is in chains, Peter denies that he knows him. And this ain't like the messenger from God knows that guy has more of a need than anybody. Yeah, they're all deserters. This guy denied him. Tell his disciples and be sure you tell Peter that God is faithful even when you feel forsaken. Even when you feel like it's all over, even when you feel like it's the end, even when you gave it your heart and more than your heart, your whole, like everything you've got and it all crashed and burned, God is faithful. And you be sure to tell Peter that even though he denied the Lord, the Lord wants to see him because the Lord loves him. This text is just oozing with the faithfulness of God, embodied in Jesus. And that's the crucial piece, friends. The faithfulness of God is embodied in Jesus. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, He is embodying the faithfulness of God. The God who says, I love you even though you've sinned against me. I will die for you even though you've rebelled against me. I will take the consequences of your transgression on myself. Even though you deserve it and I don't, this is how much I care for you. Because God is faithful when we are not. He always remains faithful. So I wonder how many of us need to spend some time praying the 22nd Psalm. It's been a hard year. Nobody thought churches would close their doors for months. Nobody thought that global economies would be closed. Nobody thought that people would die from a new virus. Nobody thought that would happen. And wonder if we can just take some time Pray that psalm. And maybe you want to pray where you are. And maybe as our music begins, you want to just come and pray at this altar.